Yes, Mr. Mallard. Good morning, my lord. My lord, I appear on behalf of the appellant in respect to this matter, and the Honourable Mr. Keith appears on behalf of the respondent. Yes, and um, I won't say any more than this. You're okay, are you? Yes, thank you very much indeed. Right, well, say if you if you um, uh, if, if you're at any point or not. Very kind. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and uh, perhaps just so we can deal with the quick bit of housekeeping. Um, uh, subject to anything Mr. Keith may say. Um, uh, I think we will be inclined simply to allow you to proceed on the basis of the uh, replacement skeleton argument. Does that create any difficulties for you, Mr. Keith? Um, my Lord, no. Uh, only one caveat. My learned friend puts ground to slightly, significantly differently to the way he's put it previously, uh, and it's not quite clear to me what he's saying about the country guidance. But he, yes, I see. Point, if at some well, point I need instructions, I might No, let's see question. how we go. I, I take the point. Um, there are one or two respects in which it's not quite the case you might have been expecting, but I think we'd be inclined to allow it unless it created real difficulties. Uh, that's the only the only minor caveat. Well, let's Otherwise see how we I'm, go. I'm content with it to start. Right. Well, that may have been two of the points you were going to be dealing with, or one of the points you were going to be dealing with, by way of preliminary. Mr. Mahmood, any other housekeeping? Or? Uh, there's one uh, additional document. Uh, I've given this to my little friend. There's reference within the first tier tribunal judge's uh, determination to a letter from the transnational government of Tamil Elam. That's not within the bundle at the moment. It's two pages, double-sided. I have copies for the court. Of course, I've given a copy to my learned friend. Yes. Um, well, I don't think there's any harm our seeing it. I, <coughs> I but this isn't, a, this isn't an appeal on the facts. No, no, so, uh, but... Uh, Okay, well, yes. it can be handed up. Yes, and I, I've numbered it rather scruffily, I'm afraid. 114 and 115 in the bottom right hand corner. The three copies. Thank you. Thank you. I'll take the report uh, to that in due course. Well, I'm, I'm in the court's hands in, 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 in many respects because in relation to ground one, it's set out in detail within the skeleton argument uh, and the grounds. Uh, I'm more than uh, happy uh, to deal with any questions that the points of, or questions or points that the court has in respect of ground one. Of course, I've seen the reference to MM. It says what it does uh, when your lordship uh, was presiding in that case. Um, the focus of my submissions is largely going to be ground two. Um, and it may be that the best use of court time is if I move to that ground. Well, you say you're in our hands, in the sense we're in your hands, if you to rely on your submissions, um, unless we have particular questions about them, uh, that's a perfectly acceptable way, way to proceed. Uh, I think I understand, speaking for myself, I understand your case sufficiently. Um, and it's an arm point I personally want to probe, but I don't know whether I could speak for my lord and my lady. Yes. No. Well, uh, if that's the way you want to deal with it, no problem. Um, you want to focus on round two. Very well. I'm well, very grateful. Thank you very much indeed. In respect of ground two, um, if I call it the surplus ground, um, there are various facets to this in that, and, and this is just an overview, and I'll of course go into detail in just a moment. When the upper tribunal considered the country guidance in GJ, of course, they were dealing with facts available to them at that time, but they also needed to de deal with the law that was applicable at that time. Did they do so? And that's with reference to H.J. Ron. We're not saying they. Uh, you're, we're talking about the the, the, the FTT. The, the, the G.J. being the upper tribunal decision, the country guidance decision. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, okay. Yes. So you're about the, the, yes. G, the G.J. Just tribunal, right? Yes, yes. So, so the upper tribunal, did it uh, consider... 
H.J. Iran, did it consider parties in Zimbabwe, i.e. the refugee surplus point? The short answer is no, but I'll come into detail, uh, just as it were, giving the court the headline. Um, what were the changes? What were the changes after G.J. was promulgated that Judge Ford, FTT Judge Ford, should have taken into account in undertaking her assessment in relation to the risk on return. Sorry, just a trivial point has been boring me. You, you, in your skeleton, refer to her as her. It is. It is her, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes. She's a judge in Birmingham. Which is oh, okay. Yes. 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 Uh, so, um, so, so what the, um, as it were, new factors uh, Judge Ford should have taken into account because, of course, as the court well knows, things move on after country guidance country guidance isn't uh, fixed. Um, what were the actual factors that the first tier tribunal found and what were the factors that the Secretary of State accepted? Because that will assist in the evaluation of the risk on return. And in some what I submit, and again it's headlines only at the moment, in some way I submitted that the uh, first tier tribunal did materia in coming to the conclusion that it did, and did not come to the right decision in relation to the uh, risk on return aspect. And I'll pause there for a moment, having given those headlines, and this is where some of the, as it were, mental gymnastics will have to come in. Um, of course, uh, first tier tribunal judge Ford uh, could not take into account the new country guidance in KK that was uh, promulgated <coughs> after her decision. After hers, but before the upper tribunal. Before the upper tribunal. Yeah, before the upper tribunal. Um, but there are relevant aspects within the country guidance of KK, which assist in evaluating uh, the risk, because there are certain facts which cannot be disputed. So by way of example, by way of example, the uh, transnational government of Tamil Elam, uh, TGTE, was prescribed by the government of Sri Lanka in 2014. Okay, can we just be get one thing clear? The you call this the surplus ground, and to me that means a risk created specifically as a result of the appellant's conduct uh, while here, irrespective of the other points about things he may have done before he le left Sri Lanka. But in introducing it, you were saying that GJ didn't deal with HJ, Iran and RT Zimbabwe. That's got nothing to do with your plus activities, has it? Well, it has. HJ Iran, just to, so you see where I'm coming from. HJ Iran and RT Zimbabwe are to do with how the appellant would wish to express their political views if returned, but the risk to them if they did so, and that is quite different from your plus. And I just want to be clear what the point being made in this ground really is, which of whether it is a point about your class activities, or whether it's a point about HJ Iran. Yes, I'm, I'm great. Because the, the, the HJ Iran point wasn't, as far as I can see, taken in front of the first year tribunal at all. In this case. In this case, we didn't. And yes. Only for the judge to deal with points which were raised before her. Subject to certain extreme cases where you don't have to take account of points of the parties. Yes. <coughs> that wasn't the way the case was advanced. 
So I just, before we got into the detail, I just yes. want to be clear what the target of these submissions really yes, is. That, that's very helpful. And it's because there are going to be various, as it were, branches to this uh, that I'll, I'll need to come on to that, and I will. But if I, again, give the court the headlines, um, part of the appellant's case here, I have uh, undertaken these surplus activities and uh, committed or not, and I'll put that to one side for a moment as well, whether, there's, whether or not there's genuine commitment or not, I will be asked about these activities on return and I will tell the truth that I did uh, undertake these surplus activities. So just pausing there for a moment, and that's where H.J. Iran... You say that, did he... Was that part of his evidence or his case in front of the FTT that he would, on return, express these views? I, I hadn't picked that up. Well, uh, the, the, the nuance of it, again, the, the headline of it, uh, um, the nuance of it is he will be asked, what were you doing in London? Did you undertake uh, activities where, and again, Paraphrasing it, relating to separatism. Well, what, he what's, the, what's the evidence that he would be asked? Who would ask him? We'll come on to that, in, in, and I, I, I will, but my lord, in terms of the assessment, the holistic assessment which needed to be undertaken. But if, if the court stays with just for the moment, and as it were, jumps forward uh, for a moment, he'll be asked this question: What will he need to do? Can he be expected to lie? The answer is no, uh, viz. H.J. Iran, R.T. Zimbabwe. Uh, that's where that comes into play. Of course, I accept that I have to overcome the hurdle. Well, will he be asked anything at all? Won't he simply be returned uh, as somebody who freely walked through the airport? So I hope that, that gives an overall picture of the direction in relation to um, that ground. <coughs> there are various branches that I'll, I'll need to come on to. Yeah. And then if I uh, please take you to uh, maybe give some structure to my submissions take you to um, the skeleton argument, my, our skeleton argument. Yes. And if I may please, page 6, paragraph 19 is where ground 2 starts. So uh, just uh, taking it briefly and paraphrasing the first couple of paragraphs 19 and 20 the judge wanted to see uh, is the appellant genuinely politically motivated and she deals with that for the court's note in the appeal bundle at 49 to 50 paragraphs 49 to So the consideration of genuinely politically motivated has to be assessed as against the case law, and I'll moment, uh, presently come on to that. I refer at paragraph 22 to the case of MSM um, which is at ta after tab 12 in the authorities bundle and I've taken from that uh, judgment uh, those paragraphs which are set out but of course we can look at it in the itself. So this was the 
Goodwin's Lotus is Beetson, uh, with which uh, Lotus is Tomlinson, and was then vice president Lotus was Morby uh, 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 agreed. It was a Secretary of State's appeal, which was uh, dismissed. And the reason I've cited this authority, uh, even though uh, it's acknowledged within the authority to be obiter, is because it, may I respect, it very succinctly summarises the case law, uh, I respect to say correctly, rather than having to refer to lots of authority, which the practice direction says, don't send lots of authorities in relation to the same thing. <coughs> So, looking at that, um, as highlighted within the skeleton argument by me with the underlying and bold, that's not part of the original. There's reference <coughs> to the well-known case of Danian. Uh, the ultimate question in, in all asylum cases, uh, the ultimate single question is whether there's a serious risk that on return the applicant will be persecuted for convention reasons. Reference to Lord Justice Simon Brown. It matters not whether the risk arises from his own conduct in this country, however unreasonable. It does not even matter whether he has cynically sought to enhance his prospects of asylum by creating the very risk on which he then relies. Cases sometimes characterised as involving bad faith. And then at 42, uh, Lord Justice Beeson, referring to Lord Justice Simon Brown, uh, said, looking at the highlighted part, however unreasonably he might be thought for refusing to accept the necessary restraint on his liberties, in my judgment, he'd be entitled to uh, asylum. And then by Lord Justice Simon Brown's approach was endorsed by Lord Hope in ATJ Iran, at paragraph 18, where Lord Hope said, the fact that an applicant for asylum can take action to avoid persecution does not disentitle him from asylum if, if in fact he will not act in a way uh, so as to avoid it. This is so even if to fail or to refuse to avoid it would be unreasonable. And also see Lord Dyson at paragraph 109 of the transcript. Um, and then the, the Vice President at fifth, paragraph 52, it may seem strange at first that a person would be at risk of persecution in his own home country only by reason of an imputed characteristic whose existence he could dispel by taking reasonable steps short of compromising his fundamental right to be entitled to claim asylum. However, I agree with Lord Justice Beetson that both the language of the qualification directive and the, direct, uh, and the decisions to which he refers point to that conclusion. So, so just pausing there for a moment, uh, it's unpalatable that he, here is somebody who has come to the United Kingdom has made uh, a false claim uh, for asylum according to the Secretary of State and the First Tier Tribunal Judge, <coughs> and then later uh, undertakes a refugee surplus activities and says it's too dangerous for me to go back again. That, that's the very point which is uh, being made here and which is then picked up later uh, in KK at the upper tribunal, i.e. the new country guidance case. And again, I'll come back to that. And again, I, of course, appreciate the mental gymnastics in terms of ensuring that I remember that it cannot be relied upon for the factual matrix aspect uh, of it. So, so that, that's the first, I respect to say, fundamental point. I'll take the court to what the tribunal said, tribunals, first here and upper tribunal said in relation to what this appellant might be able to do on return. And I don't say they went as far as saying, well, just lie and say you didn't undertake activities. Um, but they do suggest a way round, uh, which I respect. Paragraph say. 46 of the first year tribunal judgment says in terms that he, he won't be a person of interest and won't be asked anything. Yes. Because his activities were so minimal um, and so old. Yes. I mean, it was two years before the FTT tribunal. There's no fresh evidence before the upper tribunal or indeed yes. here 
So that's four years ago was his last activity. Yes. Yes. I, I, I will come on to that, but the, the, to deal with my uh, as Lord's uh, point, which is a very important one. Um, there, there were, and again, if I, as it were, give the he headlines now, there were uh, two very important changes between the country guidance of GJ in, uh, in the early part uh, of 2013. I should know it, but I think it's 2013. Uh, and uh, by the time of the hearing before Judge Ford, first year tribunal Judge Ford in December 2020. Uh, and those uh, two big aspects were the um, uh, involvement with transitional government of Tamil Ilam, TGTE. Uh, so when you say involvement with, who's involved? This appellants. Yes, I see. This appellants. Uh, and secondly, that TGTE, the same organisation, was proscribed by the government of Sri Lanka in 2014. Just, just pausing there for a moment. So, just to, to be pause. So I can understand. It's really only one point, isn't it? Now, obviously, by definition, his involvement with TGTE since uh, GJ, but I mean, that's the country guidance cases are intended to cover facts that occur in the future as long as situations can change. Yeah. So the real point is your second one, the TGTE wasn't proscribed at the time of GJ, but was proscribed um, um, uh, at the time of the activities that were relied on uh, in front of the FTT. Now why is that a material change? Yes, well, but it, the, the, both points I respectfully say are good ones in that uh, he needs to overcome the hurdle what's the relevance for TGT to your case? Well, he says it's prescribed. Secondly, I am involved with TGT. It's a separatist organisation which will immediately cause me these uh, problems and difficulties. And I was just dealing with my Lord Lord Dingerman's uh, uh, point about, well, these things were historic, uh, it has been some years and the like, but it wouldn't matter because it's a prescribed organisation. That, that, that's the difficulty. The way in which GJ, forgetting KK for a moment, the way in which GJ makes clear, there simply isn't, uh, the, the government of Sri Lanka simply doesn't tolerate separatist activity certainly wouldn't tolerate TGTD. Well, it doesn't tolerate... Uh, this is what was said in GJ and wasn't changed in KK. Um, there's a risk of persecution for those who partook... who took a, a significant role in separatist activity. But what the FTT found was he didn't have a significant role in uh, separatist activity, and certainly, which is ultimately what matters, what would be under what would be perceived by GOSL on the basis of the knowledge it might reasonably have as a significant role. And doesn't that finding create a difficulty for you? I'm going to come on to the finding whether whether, whether the finding was right in view of the evidence which cannot be disputed, and that, that's where I refer to KK, and I, I will in a moment, but, ju but just dealing with my Lord, uh, the Vice President's point, I I I is this. Um, if GJ uh, was dealing with a situation in which there was not a prescribed organisation, um, then it didn't need to say, the upper tribunal did not need to say in GJ, one of the risk factors is if you're linked to a prescribed organisation. But this appellant was. And that's a very significant factor and a very significant change from GJ. I accept the, the point that I'll need to explain further, and I will uh, in, in very shortly, how the evidence 
I respectfully submit, conclusively shows he had a significant link to TGTE. The, the other point is, so, so the, the, the TGT is proscribed, the appellant has a link, significant link to them, and there's the HJ Iran point, what will happen on return. Those, those are the changes from GJ. They were not uh, considered by GJ. So this judge, first year tribunal judge um, Ford, needed to consider the case against that background. I stay with the skeleton argument so that, uh, as I say, there's structure to the um, uh, submission. Let's hope I don't miss anything uh, as well. Um, there's extensive reference, uh, but I've dealt with uh, up to page 7 and over the page to page 8, paragraph 25 <coughs> onwards. And I don't propose to go through this in any detail, but there's reference to uh, RT Zimbabwe and HJ Iran. Um, I'll just spend a, a, a few moments. Uh, again, this is available. Uh, RT Zimbabwe is available. Yes, just before we get there, uh, yes. it's crucial to your whole submissions. There are the sentence at the beginning of Power 24. You said you want to come back to that later. Upon questioning on return to Sri Lanka or having been monitored through the airport and questioned later in his home area, will be asked questions about his time in the UK. Yes. That's an assertion by you, but um, at the moment I'm not clear on what it's based, so, but you'll may come back to that. So, right, you were taking us through what followed. Uh, 25 and 20, paragraphs 25 and 26b. And this can't be seriously disputed in, in, in any of the very clear, I respectfully say, Supreme Court authority in HJ Iran and RT Zimbabwe. Um, and again, I highlighted and uh, put in bold certain uh, aspects. Um, paragraph 26, uh, which also then refers about halfway down to paragraph 26 of Lord Dyson's uh, judgment in RT Zimbabwe. Uh, he said, his lordship said, the HJ Iran principle applies to any person who has political beliefs and is obliged to con uh, conceal them in order to avoid the persecution that he would suffer if he were to reveal them. Uh, leading counsel, Mr. Swifter, the then was, was referred to strong case uh, for convention protection, but stopped short of an unqualified acceptance of the point. And Lord Dyson said, in my view, there's no basis for such reticence. Uh, and there's reference then uh, to I think that was an Australian authority. Uh, as, as, as you've um, rightly said, these are very familiar authorities to yes. us. I, I yes. must, of course, emphasise the points of key importance, but I don't think you need to as it were, walk us through this. I'm grateful. I'm very grateful. That's very helpful. Um, so, uh, I'll, therefore, I'll, I'll, uh, you'll, you'll, the court will note similar references to paragraph 27 to RT Zimbabwe, which are <coughs> set out there and then pausing at paragraph 28 this brings in the, the further branch which I was referring to um, and this is the genuine commitment so Judge um, Ford had referred to uh, the expectation of genuine commitment at paragraph 49 but hang on isn't the importance of genuine commitment in the uh, RT Zimbabwe situation the whole this the whole premise of the RT Zimbabwe line of authorities is that you do have political beliefs which you would wish to express but if returned uh, would be unable to express uh, because of the risk of the persecution if you did if you don't have any such genuine commitment in the first place, there is no such risk. 
the whole premise of it is you do genuinely have those beliefs which you want to express. If there's a finding of fact that you don't genuinely have them, as long as that finding of fact is, is proper on the evidence, the whole H.J. Iran, R.T. Zimbabwe line of argument simply doesn't arise, does it? Um, I, I'll explain why I respectfully submit it does. Right. Firstly, R.T. Zimbabwe was not a case in which an appellant or the appellant uh, wanted to assert positive political affiliation. In you fact, they wanted that. We'd have to look at it to see. Yes, but happened to, be, happened to have been, in, as it happened, uh, with one of the judges in uh, in KK. So, so, so the uh, just giving a very quick overview, uh, and of course, I'll take the court to the judgment in just a moment. Um, the problem with Zimbabwe was that they there were roadblocks and the like, and people seeking to pass through them would have to show their commitment and uh, endorsement of the ZANU PF, the President Mugabe regime. Yes, and if they didn't, which was sometimes tested. The, the people passing would be asked to explain, or rather sing, the loyalty songs of the ZANU PF, and they'd need to know them and to say, <coughs> in effect, yes, I support the ZANU PF. President Mugabe is excellent, and uh, uh, please let me through. And what Lord Dyson and, and indeed the Supreme Court was saying, well, in fact, appellants should be able to say. I don't want to have any political belief, and I should be entitled to hold that position. But is, is does that make a difference in principle? Not, not necessarily. Because no, no. the the genuine commitment, if you like, yes. would be: I do not believe in ZANU PF. I'm not prepared to declare loyalty to it. Yes. That would be a genuine commitment, even if you had no positive belief the other way. So. I'm, Sure, that difference on the facts affects the principle. Um, what, in my respect, that, that assists this appellant uh, because uh, the, the, the principle is the same where he is asserting, at the very least, at the very least, through refugee surplus activity. So e even if the tribunal is to assume. Well, he's lied to through his back teeth. He's not telling the truth in relation to his commitment. If, and I accept, I need to deal with the if. If he's asked questions, what did you do in London? He would have to tell the truth, would tell the truth, and that would cause a difficulty. He cannot be expected to say, well, I was an economic migrant and I was just trying to make some money, or I didn't do anything of a separatist nature or align myself with those people. So, so that's how, as it were, the two aspects dovetail. Yes, thank you. Uh, and my Lord, so uh, staying with page 9, on to paragraph 29, which is the reference to the country guidance case in GJ itself. It was 2013, so I'm <laughs> glad I remember that. Uh, and I've just taken two short paragraphs there. We know it's a very, very long, detailed judgment uh, indeed. Um, and I'll, I'll take, uh, and as happens with these country guys' case, some aspects assist the appellant, some, uh, but in the same paragraph, others don't. So we can just give me through uh, bottom of page nine, uh, my paragraph 29, which is the tribunal's paragraph 351. Our overall conclusion uh, regarding the diaspora activities is that the government of Sri Lanka has sophisticated intelligence in able to distinguish between those who are actively involved in seeking to revive and refund the separatist movement within the di diaspora uh, with a view to destabilizing the unitary Sri Lankan state. Attendance at one or more. I'm so sorry. I thought I had the passage, but I haven't. Which par which paragraph are you on? Uh, uh, 
paragraph 29 of my skeleton argument. Oh, your skeleton um, argument. I'm so sorry. I was yes, paragraph 29. Of the yes, okay. And yes, I see, yeah. Yes, and that refers to paragraph 351. Yes, no, no, no problem. Now I, I yes. <coughs> yeah, carry on, do. Uh, and that, that, on one reading, well, it goes against this appellant. Yeah, he says, I did attend several demonstrations, uh, and that's not going to be enough. Uh, if I paraphrase 351. And then 352, uh, those who might try to get a travel document from the uh, Sri Lankan High Commission, the abbreviation name London, or uh, another uh, uh, diaspora, uh, uh, diaspora hotspot will have file, a file created in Colombo and will be interviewed in London. So just, just, as I say, skimming through that just to, and I'll come back to GJ uh, in, in a moment. Paragraph 31 refers to the, this court's decision in MP uh, when the country guidance of GJ uh, was uh, considered. Um, and I referred to what was said by the then Vice President and I've uh, highlighted and put in bold my emphasis uh, towards the bottom of page, uh, sorry, paragraph 50. Sorry, this is confusing if I may say so. Yes. 50 is in fact from my concurring judgment. When you say his lordship, you mean me, don't you? Or am I, have I, have I muddled myself? I've just remind myself whether you were at that stage. I'm sorry, I may have forgotten. Uh, it doesn't matter, but... Um, it's certainly a... It's, it's, I'm so sorry. You're, yes, no, no, that's it. That's it, that, that, that's it. As, as you say, um, Lord Justice Morris Kay delivered the judgment. Uh, which is one to, one to forty eight. Yes, it, it, that, that's my. Uh, it, it was uh, vice president was Lord Justice Morris K. Um, and then at fifty. Yes. I just made a little um, one additional point, yes. which I think isn't quite on the point we're concerned. Although you underlined it, I don't yes. actually think is is the point we're concerned with here. Is it? The only point I was making there was that although what GJ said is the real, what they're really interested in now, yeah. in the typical kind of case we get in London, get, get here in the UK, is GJ uh, is uh, diaspora activism. Not really interested in what you did in the past, it's whether you're still at, still uh, uh, actively uh, pursuing Tamil separatism. And I just put a footnote to that, say I'm sure that's generally the case, but there may be cases where something you did in Sri Lanka before you left might suggest that you were a, uh, a continuing risk to the regime, even if you had kept quiet in your diaspora activities. That's the point I was making there, which is, I hope, right. But whether it's right or not isn't the issue we got here. That's, that's very helpful. So, that, that, as it were, my, my lords ex explained that, and that, that's very helpful. So, I can move on from, from that. Um, so, then, paragraph 33 of my skeleton argument, um, which refers to KK, and with the communication uh, received from the court yesterday, with the, I brought copies and provided to my little friend as well. The full uh, judgment of the tribunal in KK. Um, yes, embarrassingly, having said what I did, I did actually print out not the whole thing, which is very long, but the, it seemed to me to be the key paragraphs, and I left them in my room. But I suspect I can, I can um, do without them for the moment. Yes, sir. Because uh, let's see how we go. So, what, what was the particular points you wanted to refer to from KK? I'm just hesitating to whether it might be more helpful if, 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 if in view of uh, the quite proper uh, questions asked about the background, whether I should deal with the background of this appellant first and then take you to uh, KK. If I, if I, if I do Up to that, you, Mr. Mahmood, whichever I'm very you think works, Thank you. We'll, 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 we'll listen either way. So I'm, I'm very grateful. If I may skip then for a moment, please, uh, to paragraph 40 of my skeleton argon, which is page 12. And I'll, uh, 
there's, there's a list of ten items here. Some will be very quick, and the others I'll, I'll pause on them to make good uh, what I'm submitting there. So first of all, the appellant stands out because he's of Tamil ethnicity. So that, that that's can't be disputed, accepted in the refusal letter, accepted by the judge. Two, he hails from Jaffna, an area where separatism is sought. Again, in the refusal letter, accepted by uh, the judge. Three, is he'd lived in London for over 10 years as of December 2020, i.e. the time of the hearing. Uh, second part of paragraph three, London is seen as one of the few hotspots for diaspora with separatist views as assessed by the government of Sri Lanka, uh, he'd be returning from a hotspot. Hot uh, can't be disputed, it's within, uh, I'll find it again, it's within the uh, previous country guidance. Four, the appellant has scarring which singles him out. I've referred there to the bundle, uh, the, the appeal bundle at page 30 take the court to that to make that good. Take us to page 30, para 30, which we've done. Uh, oh, I see, it's not page 30. You're yes. right, it's page 47. I've got the paragraph numbers wrong somewhere. Yes, I, I see, it's page 47. Yeah, we have the pack. Um, that's just the judge um, uh, summarising the uh, UK fact finding mission report from January 2020. It's, 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 it's in fact page 47. Oh, my, my apologies. Yes, paragraph yes, 30. Yes, so scarring can lead to questioning, but the yes. risk is affected by whether the returning is known to the authorities as a person of interest. So yeah, that, that's clearly relevant from what part of anything else. Well, what I understand that to mean, or the implication of that to be, that unless the scars are something that we be seen as you. Um, walk through the airport or are questioned in some other circumstances um, uh, they're not going to be uh, of interest if someone is being seriously interrogated and perhaps therefore they have to take off their clothes and they can see scarring then it might be significant but scars in this case were, were not something that would have him stopped at the airport are they? Not, not, where, not where these scars are located uh, but just as my lord has said uh, as part of interrogation, if asked about scarring, it is one of the considerations of ten. Thank you. He's, he's got scarring, and it can yeah. lead to <coughs> five. He was treated for injuries at hospital, including a wound in July uh, 2012, but it was not accepted. Now we've got the the opponent was saying this is what the government of Sri Lanka or the authorities give to me. Uh, the judge didn't accept that, but accepted he was treated for injuries, including a wound. Let's see if I've got the page number right this time. Uh, page 30, paragraph 19. learning which I appreciated which is uh, sometimes working electronically and hard copy it's easy to, to keep up uh, page numbers up so middle of uh, paragraph 19 uh, fourth line or so down page 30 the judge accepted in the end that to the low standard of proof the appellant had established that he'd been treated for injuries in July 2012 but not that those injuries were caused in the way claimed during his detention by the Sri Lankan authorities. So, again, as a 
enumerative exercise in item 5 we have these injuries and these issues forward. 6 <coughs> he's a card holding member of the transnational government of Tamil Elam is that is that accurate um card is a Tamil Elam card um I understood, but perhaps I've not got this right, that that was something issued to him in Sri Lanka. Um, a long time ago, and produced by him fairly recently. I'm just trying to see where I got that from. With the card itself isn't in the bundle, is it? It's not. It's 21B of the first tier tribunal, just a reference to it, and then um, page 44, it just says he wasn't asked about it. Yes, that's correct. But it's described as a Tamil Elam card, which is not the same as... Tamil Elam is what you, we used to call the TTE, the Tamil Tigers, isn't it? not the same as the TGTE. I don't know. I'm, I'm I'll, I'll, I'll come back to, to that. I'll about, make sure about, I clear this. About, about, about yes. this. I'll, ma I'll make sure I clear, I clear this up, but he's a card-holding member uh, of one of those, and I'll make sure I get the, as it were, chapter and verse to make sure that I give you the, I give the court the accurate. Yes, thank you. I, I, I may be wrong, but I, I just... Um, Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so that was six. On to seven. Photographs showing that he attended demonstrations here in the UK. The judge, first here tribunal judge, wasn't particularly impressed uh, with the photographs, uh, but they show him at the protests or events. Um, and I'll give a little bit more detail in respect to those shortly. <coughs> Eight. A letter from the transnational government of Tamil Elam. Uh, he's a volunteer. Uh, the letter was never rejected. I've submitted there. Judge Ford's uh, observation, I think I should say rather, and complaint was that uh, it was dated very close to the date of the hearing in December 2020. 12 days before. 12 days before. But importantly, not rejected. Uh, nine, some of the detail uh, in respect of the TGTE, the Transnational Government Appeal Bundle, page 45, subparagraph E. Skimming down, he got it from the Wembley office, said the appellant, it was dated the 3rd December then, um, six lines down, the letter was signed by Mr. Sokolingam Yoga Lingam, who's a member of the transnational government of Tamil Elam. He describes the appellant as volunteer at several public events in the UK for the organisation. They're in support of a free Tamil Elam in Sri Lanka. The events are 2016, 17, and 18, are referred to. Um, and then there's an indentation of part of what is said uh, in that letter. I think there's a slight um, formatting issue, but then the judge goes on about halfway down with her determination when she says, when the appellant was asked and evidence was written, she gave a slightly different name. Um, Now, the overarching point here is that there was this letter uh, from Mr. Yogalingam, and Mr. Yogalingam features quite heavily in KK, uh, 
with references to him. He gave evidence in KK. And so this would be one of the indisputable facts in relation to uh, uh, the veracity of uh, Mr. Yogalingam. And of course I take on uh, my lady's uh, point that, look, you know, the hearing was on, I think, the 19th or 20th of December, and just uh, less than two weeks before he produces uh, this, this letter. And was there a witness right. statement from Mr. Yogalingam? Was there a witness statement, did my lady ask? Yes. Uh, uh, not as far as I'm aware, no, my lady. And there, there might be all sorts of reasons why somebody who's uh, an MP for the TGTE uh, provides his letter close to the date of the hearing. Uh, whether it's because he's busy or he doesn't want to, it, it could be any one of those within the um, spectrum. But the, my submission is this document was not rejected as being fake or unreliable. What, what did it say? Well, I refer to this now, if I may, please. And this is what I handed in this morning, which is uh, numbered as 114 and 115. I'll just, uh, as I was saying, going down this list, I'll take a little more time, some of the uh, items, and I will spend just a few more minutes on this, if I may, please. So it, it refers to uh, the appellant SR. Um, it's written by Mr. Sokolingam, Yoga Lingam. He's a TGT MP. Well, and it's then quite a long document. Speaking for myself, I've taken the opportunity one two gaps to read it through. Yes. But I, I think just to of course, you must take us to the passages that really yeah. that you want to emphasize, but I don't think it's a useful use of time just to walk of course. through paragraph by paragraph. I, I want, I, I, well, I'm which are the bits that matter? Extremely I'll be, that's extremely helpful. Having given the introduction to page one, it's page two yes. where there's the specific focus for this uh, appellant, and there are probably. Well, shall, shall, we, shall we read that? that? Yes, thank you very much. Yes, please. Oh, very good. Okay. Uh, uh, now, what, what in particular do you want to ask? So, 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 well, I, I submit there are that. nine uh, very specific and important references to the appellant's involvement with TGTE. Uh, he's a volunteer, uh, looking from the top, he's volunteered for several public events. Uh, third line, he not only attends many meetings, but takes active role. Uh, this is, I'm to call them very familiar South Asian language, as it were, with some difference in uh, uh, grammar. Uh, 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 active role in organizing events and public demonstrations. Uh, the MP says, after witnessing the appellant's true commitment and dedication. I'm afraid you are. You are just reading it out, which I thought the whole point was to. I was well, not going to read all that, but but I'll, I'll so so that was the third point. He, yes. the witness, had witnessed. Uh, sorry, uh, he, the MP, has witnessed this for himself and seen the true commitment. Or he's now given a responsible role. <coughs> uh, third line, second para, 
among many, I can name a few events in which you've played a key role. And then he gives some examples. The end of the second paragraph, uh, including selling dinner tickets to fundraise for the de-proscription of LTTE case in the UK and many more. Next paragraph, his activities go beyond mere attendance. He continues to express his political aspiration public, publicly as his photos often appear in media. He is very likely to be in the interest of the Sri Lankan authorities. Uh, last paragraph, third line. Um, he is an ardent supporter of our mission and desires the independence of Tamils in Sri Lanka. He continues to express his political aspiration publicly. And just also in that paragraph, uh, they are saying that the Sri Lankan government is committed uh, ongoing, committing ongoing genocide. So I respectfully say a very detailed, important letter from an MP at TGTE saying these things in relation to this specific uh, appellant. But, but how do you deal with the findings of fact that the first tier tribunal judge made in relation? which is that it was delayed, it was very odd that it came so late, hadn't been handed to legal representatives. And then in paragraph 46, assessed what actually he, he the, um, the tribunal judge found he had done, which was not accepting the, the letter in, as, as, as in, in its terms. Well, the, the trouble is that the what the judge says, uh, paragraph forty-six, line five, I think it is. Yeah, lines four and five. Uh, there's there's no reasonable explanation for the delay. The description of the appellant's activity for the PGT and his profile does not fit in with his own account and seems greatly exaggerated. Even if the order of the letter is accurate in the description of the extent of the appellant's activities. I'm not satisfied that those activities, selling some tickets for a fundraiser and attending a limited number of protests, will be known to the Sri Lankan authorities or will be of any interest to them. So just pausing there, with respect to the judge, that's not what the letter says. He didn't just uh, sell some tickets uh, and attend uh, a limited number of protests. That's why I've taken the time to go through this letter. But this, what if I may say so, this isn't a round of appeal at all. Where do I find this in the rounds of appeal? Well, Effectively the, saying that the judge made findings, factual findings, which were not open to her on the evidence. It's quite an ambitious finding, particularly in circumstances where we don't have a full account of what the evidence in front of her was. We don't know. We don't have a note of what, of what he said in cross-examination or anything like that. Well, so I, shall I, we just look I, at the rounds and see? Yes. What, what where, where do we find a challenge to the factual finding on the grounds that it's not ap op open to her on the evidence? Well, my, f my first submission is this, that in fact there is no sufficient basis for the court, for the tribunal to have concluded that, uh, uh, rather, my apologies, there's no sufficient basis for this court to conclude that the letter was not accepted. What has happened? Well, hang on, sorry, it's not yes. a question of this court. It's a question of looking at the FTT's decision yes. on the basis of the material before the FTT and saying this is a conclusion the FTT judge could not reasonably have reached, which is more or less what you were saying just now. And that's why I pick you up on it, because yes. I don't see where in the grounds of appeal, either to us or indeed to the upper tribunal, well, I'm not sure about the upper tribunals, I haven't checked, but certainly to us, that was a, a ground of appeal. Well, can we, can we look at the grounds of appeal? Of course, yes. Uh, and at pages 14 to, to or the relevant, yes, 14 to 16, which is ground two, the one you're on. Yes. And the headline of the ground, 
very bottom of 14 is the wrong legal test was applied in respect of refugees yes. surplus activities. Genuine commitment is not the test for refugees yes. surplus activities. Yes. And that's the legal point. Uh, and then you, you or the author, it is you, yes, yes. Um, go on uh, and make various uh, uh, assertions um, which appear to be largely based on GJ, sophisticated means and so forth. Then you say at 12 that he will be stopped. That's a point we've raised already. I'm not sure you've yet come back to. Uh, 13, a point about the country guidance. 14, the new country guidance. Uh, but I don't see there any pleading. The judge could not reasonably have reached the conclusion that she did in para 46. Well, well th this... Um, the focus of that uh, finding aspect was ground one, which was the judge saying, this is incredible. Uh, I, I, uh, and if, if uh, the court considers my submissions in, in, in this way, please, that ground one is the judge simply placed too high a standard in relation to assessing this appellant's evidence. Part of that evidence is this TGTE letter. What did she actually say in relation to her findings? She said, well, look, it's come very late in the day without a reasonable explanation for the delay. That's part one. Even though she said that, she did not reject the TGTE letter. And what I'm submitting to this court is... Well, is that right? That's isn't, isn't her primary finding? that his profile doesn't fit with his own account and seems greatly exaggerated. That's her primary finding about the letter. And then she goes on and says, even if, so if I'm wrong about that, even if the author is accurate, so on and so forth, not satisfied that any of this will make, make him of interest to the Sri Lankan authorities. What's wrong with that? Well, the, the, the trouble is with, with it is the first part, which is, there is no part of it where it's great, greatly exaggerated because this was the appellant's case. But it, it, uh, the, yes. the appellant's case so far, and we obviously don't have a transcript of the evidence, well, she, but, but the appellant's case so far as one can pick it up from the tribunal's judgment was, um, I've done a lot, but actually I haven't done anything for the last two years because I can't see very well. Um, and um, the letter says he's one of our best most supported persons. Now, you might have thought that was a stunning inconsistency, um, which the judge was perfectly entitled to say, well, it, it doesn't fit with his own profile. I mean, part of the difficulty is there's nothing in... There, there are only two witness statements in the bundle, and yes. neither of the witness statements says anything about your class activities. So, to the extent that he gave evidence about those your class activities, it must have been either in questions elicited by his representative um, or in cross-examination, and we've just got no record of, of any of that. Dealing with my lady's point first, and I'll come back, of course, to my Lord, Lord Justice England's uh, point in, in just a moment. Um, this court will well know how difficult it is for uh, appellants and their solicitors at the first tier tribunal to be able to deal with these cases with the funding such as it is and, and those sorts of matters. Of course, I accept that the statement should have been much, much more detailed. Uh, the evidence should have been presented uh, in a much better fashion, but it wasn't. And I'm not going to pretend uh, that, uh, that that isn't the case. No, I'm not but criticizing that. My point is a rather different one, which is that when the, um, the FTT says his profile does not fit with his own account, we simply have no means of assessing whether or not that is accurate because we don't have any record of the evidence he gave to the FTT. So, so you're, you're not in a strong position to challenge that assessment. Well, I respectfully say that there, there, there isn't anything within the judge's decision because that's, that's the judgment and the decision and the order all, all in one. Which part of it was 
which part of the evidence did the judge conclude, well, uh, this is wrong? Uh, I, I accept, I accept that um, the judge has said it, it seems greatly exaggerated. Um, but one can't see that, and it must, there has to be an all encompassing determination. Um, well, in page 112, what he says in paragraph 13 of his witness statement, which I, one of it infers he would have uh, confirmed, is I also did some voluntary work with the transnational Tamil government, which is uh, hardly putting it as high as the letter, and therefore on the face of it, justifying on its own the um, comment that judge made, particularly when you take into account that the letter came three days before, wasn't given to the lawyers, and all those other aspects of it. And we can tell that he was questioned about why, <coughs> and he didn't give a satisfactory answer. Do, do you judge says so. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'll come on to, to that in just a moment. Dealing with my Lord, my Lord Dingman's uh, point about pages, page 112. Page 111 shows this was a statement for the further submissions which yeah. was relied upon. Uh, as we can see at paragraph one. Yeah, well, it's his and second one. His first statement, um, as I think my lady has already pointed out, doesn't... Uh, yes. So at 30... Oh, sorry for interrupting. <coughs> I apologize. At 30... Um, paragraph 13, page 112, I also did some voluntary work. Um, so he's referring at paragraph 12 to... And all of this is brief. Uh, his whole history is set out uh, at paragraph 12, what happened in Sri Lanka. Paragraph 13, I also did some voluntary work, which is right. And what he then has the TGT letter to provide further detail. Um, he provided a TGT letter with his further submissions, but they don't seem to be in the bundle. That's referred to in the 2019 decision letter. So he's already provided one letter from the TGT page 94 of the bundle. Thank you. Thank you. And that letter must have been, must have formed the date before the 26th of May 2017, because it was considered in a refusal letter dated the 26th of May 2017, which also isn't in the bundle. Yes, uh, uh, on, yes I see. That, uh, 93, letter from transnational government. <coughs> that, uh, uh, While we're on it, honest, I'm not yeah. sure whether this is where I got it, but um, at 94, yeah. right in the middle, paragraph starting, you also state that since you have your Tamil Elam national identity card, and this show, I think that's, that is what I had in mind when I, was, um, uh, when I said I wasn't sure this was anything issued by the TGTE, yes. um, but something that uh, was issued by people in the Tamil dominated parts of Sri Lanka during the Civil War, but anyway. Thank I, you. I just thought that we'd seen that. Yes, back. we're on that page. Yes, yes. Well, that's very right. Okay, but to come back to the point made by yes. my, the points made by my well, lord and my lady. Um, again, it's the way one looks at this. I respectfully say that that supports the appellant's case because even if he's produced his TGT letter on the date that he has it, just under two weeks before the hearing, he's provided an earlier one doesn't seem to have a date, I think. Um, no, it doesn't refer to a date. And the date of this uh, for the submissions document, I think, is 2019. Well, it's clear, it's clear from the context that he must have provided it with yes. the submissions that were considered in the 2017 decision. I don't know what the date of those submissions was. Yes. So, so if, if he's provided a letter before, and this is the second one, it tends to support his case that it isn't uh, a, a recent uh, volunteering that he's referring to. I, 
Horse it all tea depends. Well, it all depends what it said. Yes, yeah. uh, exactly. Um, we, we, you have, a, I'm afraid, a, a real difficulty here that you are seeking in your oral submissions, I some extent we saw it coming in these subsequent submissions, really to say that the, that the findings in paragraph 46 weren't open to the judge on the evidence she saw. The only way you can make such a case good is to show us the evidence she saw, which would, was actually obviously quite miscellaneous. I, I suspect, you haven't actually told us this, but I think it's to be inferred that uh, apart from the two witness statements, there was also further submissions and documents attached to further submissions, including some <coughs> photographs. Uh, then uh, he will have given evidence in chief, uh, of which the judge will have taken a note. It can be obtained in the so-called record of proceedings if it's important. And he will have been cross-examined. And we don't have any of the notes of that. You have, um, I'm afraid, a real difficulty in any submission to the effect that if, unless there was some discrete error of law, the judge wasn't entitled to reach the conclusions she reached in paragraph 46. Well, Lord, I'd, uh, the way I drafted the grounds, uh, uh, and I'm, of course I haven't taken the court, and I don't intend to unless it will uh, <coughs> be required, um, said in ground one, the evidence was not evaluated correctly because the wrong standard of proof has been applied. Uh, if that does not encompass the ground, uh, then the most I can say in relation to that is uh, the court, this court has the letter. It can, uh, that's the 20, December 2020 letter. We did, my own friend and I, seek to uh, get a hold of the Home Office bundle. Um, we have one original version. Um, we were trying to get an electronic copy for my own friend. If, 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 if uh, it's appropriate, uh, may I say, if, if it's convenient to the court, and I'd certainly invite the court at, say, 12 noon, just looking at the clock, to give me a short break, please. And in that very short break, I don't mean more than 10 minutes, I'll quickly flick through the Home Office bundle as well, uh, with my instructing solicitor to see if we can find this letter from 2019, I think, as well. Um, the short point, though, the short point, Sorry, though... Sorry, which letter from 2019? Uh, the um, TGT letter... No, it must, it must bear a date um, earlier than yes. 2017 reasons for refusal letter. Yes. Oh, yes, of course, because this is a citation of the earlier uh, <coughs> response which is referred to, yes. We'll, we'll, we'll seek to find that as, as soon as we can. But the short point is, uh, this was important evidence available to uh, the judge. Um, and whether one uh, says it was uh, exaggerated or minimized, um, I, I submit that when reading paragraph 46 uh, as a whole, there was not a rejection of uh, that letter. <coughs> Exaggeration was suggested uh, by uh, the judge. I'll just turn it off so I don't misquote what's being said. Paragraph 46, lines 4 and 5, defendant's activities, his profile doesn't fit, with his own account seems greatly exaggerated. Uh, even if the letter, uh, the author of the letter is accurate, I'm not satisfied these activities, selling tickets, etc., will be known to the Sri Lankan authorities or will be in, of interest to them. Um, even if the court just focuses on the, the latter part uh, of that, I respectfully say the court can quite easily see the letter for itself and whether it really only says those things or whether it's the nine points which I've referred to. The 
KK Upper Tribunal Country Guidance Decision refers to this very witness uh, and uh, a letter which he wrote on behalf of one of those appellants. Some of the references are similar uh, to what's said here. The witness was accepted as reliable uh, and... Uh, Did he give evidence to the tribunal in KK? Uh, yes, he... I'm almost certain he did. Uh, well, that's rather different, isn't it? Yes. Because all, all we know is that there's a letter which purports to be from this person. He didn't give evidence to the FTT. So, so why is the FTT bound to accept anything in the letter? Well, my lady, FTT here in the country guidance hearing, I respect, but very different I I indeed. Uh, even uh, as that's, this court will know. That's not the point I'm making. Yeah, I, I, j just to, to illustrate that, e even uh, expert witnesses when uh, giving evidence at the FTT, nobody, no party calls them, uh, their evidence is considered uh, on the paper. Uh, similar here, uh, here was a, a letter... It's not provided. similar here because there'd been no agreement to admit um, this letter because it was produced very late and the Home Office didn't have an opportunity to consider it. It's similar in that the witness is not called live. So that, that would be, I respectfully say, uh, uh, unusual. Of course I accept uh, uh, in a country guidance case the tribunal wants uh, the witnesses uh, who are able to attend to give evidence so that they can provide as much assistance as is required, as is evident from the very detailed decision uh, which has been uh, provided. Lord, is that convenient moment just so I can... As well, I'm not sure it is. Uh, I, it, I'm sorry, if you're telling me you, you want to break... Just to stretch my legs, for, uh, uh, even though I've been standing, just stretch my back is really what I mean. Uh, uh, well, uh, okay, for that reason, yes. Um, how much longer do you think you're going to be? Um, I feel we've covered most of the ground, but I mean, I don't uh, hurry you in any way. I'll, I'll be surprised if I'm longer than half an hour, my lord. Uh, yes, so, so, so I think I will be too. Very well, you may have, you may have ten minutes for that... For, uh, for that. Ten minutes maximum for that reason. Um, uh, thank you. I'm very grateful. Thank you.
Yes, Mr. Well, well, very Mr. Good. Thank you very much indeed. Um, well, just before uh, that short adjournment, um, uh, there was reference to the earlier letter from the TGCE, <coughs> which is referred to in the Secretary of State's decision from 2019. We, we don't have that. Uh, there is the actual further submissions decision, which is within a Home Office bundle, uh, the original Home Office bundle that's been provided to me. That's dated the 26th of May 2017, and I'll just refer to a very short extract in relation to the letter. Have you shown this to Mr. Keith? Uh, well, it's, it's the Home Office bundle, but I'll, I'll read that as well. Well, it is. It. I'll read that Mr. Keith must be assumed to know the Home Office bundle by it. Yes. Well, 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 when you read it out, well, why not read it out and then, if necessary, yes, you can ask to see it. Yes. So this is that internal page seven, uh, subheading letter from letter from transitional government of Tamil Elam. You submitted a letter from the transnational government of Tamil Elam, which that states you're a volunteer. It's accepted that this organisation was listed on 25th February 2014 as a proscribed organisation in Sri Lanka. However, you are merely a low-level helper, and your activities include low, uh, local community work. So, uh, That's on page 93 of the bundle. Yes, yes, um, that's the reference. Yes. Yes. I'm very grateful. Thank you very much. No, I'm sorry, so. Yes, that is familiar. Yes. Uh, so what, what I was going to say, the, uh, I, I don't know where that letter is, uh, my, my, and it's not copied in the Home Office um, bundle, uh, whether the original's been retained there and it's within the Home Office files, uh, I, I'm afraid I, I, I don't know. Or the, the, the letter is referred to, uh, must have existed for the Home Office to have commented uh, upon it. Uh, and there's an acknowledgement there of involvement with the TGT, but uh, says the Secretary of State, uh, your uh, uh, low-level helper, and your activities included local community work. That, in 2017, was said about the uh, appellant um, still links him to the TGTE. So it comes on to the issue of uh, how would that make a material difference on a return to uh, this appellant. And when I started the uh, submissions earlier today, I said there were the three aspects, i.e. TGTE, HJ Iran uh, aspect. I accept, of course, what the board uh, invites me to consider, which is uh, that at paragraph 46, the first tier tribunal judge uh, says this seems uh, greatly uh, exaggerated. Um, even if uh, one focuses on that aspect uh, and that part of the finding alone, there's no rejection of the link to TGTE. And if the country evidence is correct that there's simply no standing for any separatist activity, then that's still <coughs> a very serious situation for uh, this, um, this appellant. So I respectfully say that the fact that, in fact, there was an earlier uh, letter from 2017, or referred to within the 2017 decision, uh, and there is the further evidence in 2020, supports the appellant that there's been a continuation of the activities that he's undertaken. I, I have to accept, and I do accept, uh, that uh, the judge said what she did about uh, exaggeration. So 
Court, staying with Judge Ford's uh, decision, if I invite the Court's attention to paragraph 48, and we're looking at 46. Um, my apologies. Can I, can I first of all just uh, look at 40, paragraph 47 as well, which is at the, as it were, same place, bottom of page 49, top of page 50. The judge said, I do not accept that this appellant, uh, this appellant is genuinely politically uh, motivated. Um, and the court will have seen uh, my submissions that I say that's the wrong test. Um, there does not need to be genuine political uh, motivation. But, but how does that wrong test fit into her analysis? Uh, partly because the judge is considering how this uh, appellant will seek to get through any difficulties of questioning or interrogation. Well, hang on. Uh, what, what, uh, you, you keep saying you'll come back to this point, but I don't think you have yet. Uh, what, what is the reason to believe that he will be interrogated? GJ says that there are no airport checks for people who uh, don't have a profile. The judge has already found that uh, he doesn't have a profile. He would simply walk through the airport, wouldn't he? Well, I will come on to that in, ju in just a moment. I, it, as it were, in passing, I, I thought important as it's there to deal with the paragraph 47, genuine political motivation. Um, I, I respectfully say it's wrong, it's uh, materially wrong for the judge to have uh, said what she did about genuine political motivation. <coughs> it's the wrong test. 48, paragraph 48. On top well, it's the page. right test, funnily enough, if, um, which you're saying sh she should have done, she was considering H.J. Iran or R.T. Zimbabwe. Because if you don't have a genuine political motivation, you're not likely to want to manifest it uh, on return. Yes. That's, so that's it's a relevant it. finding, for that purpose at least. But it's, 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 it's the wrong finding. That, that's the trouble. Um, uh, in that... Well, I'm not sure, even something. sure that's entirely true. You're yes. obviously right to remind us, as you helpfully did at the <coughs> beginning, that opportunistic or bad faith surplus activities may nevertheless found a claim for protection if they create a real risk. But if you take place in surplus activities, take part, I should say, in surplus, surplus activities, um, in the absence of any genuine political motivation, that is at least relevant to the assessment whether you will uh, 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 what the um, extent of such activities is likely to have been, where there's a dispute about that, and also about how uh, they might be perceived by the government of Sri Lanka, which, as they say in JGJ, has a sophisticated informal network and can count the people who are real threats to it from those who aren't. So I don't think the question of motivation is irrelevant, even on that question. Though I do accept, for the reason you gave, it's not the test as such. Is that a fair summary? That it, it, it's, that, that, that is factually what has occurred, that the judge has made her adverse finding. The appellant is not genuinely politically motivated. The reason she's made that because that then ties in with her decision in respect to the she overall. She hasn't found he's at no risk because he's not genuinely politically motivated. She's found that he he won't be at risk for the reasons that she gives in paragraph forty six. Well, it it, go, it goes further, and this is why I was going to come on to four to paragraph forty eight, because she seems to, as it were, bring everything together and take stock of paragraph forty eight. 
The difficulty with this claim is not that the claim is inconsistent with the background evidence, but that it's inherently incredible and not supported by sufficient reliable evidence. So just, just pausing there for, for a moment. Uh, we, we haven't gone through the case law in respect of plausibility, credibility, etc., but I know the, the court will well know. Look at everything, including considering the background evidence. Then come to your decision about credibility. So this judge is saying, uh, it's not inconsistent. with the background evidence. I, it is, obvious point, it is consistent with the background evidence. But it's inherently incredible and you haven't supported it with sufficiently reliable evidence. Now, I respectfully say that's wrong. Uh, and in any, and so, so the first part is wrong. Secondly, in any event, If it is consistent with the background evidence, which part of the evidence was unreliable? The unreliability comes from, well, you could have called your cousins to give evidence. Um, you're not genuinely politically motivated, uh, and such like. And that's where, where it's necessary to look at ground one in, in, in that light and to consider what the risk on return aspect will endure for or bring for this uh, appellant uh, on return. Um, it can't be consistent uh, and then with the deficiencies which, which have been uh, highlighted. And what I've set out in the skeleton argument was some of the findings of Judge McCall, first here Tribunal Judge McCall in 2013, uh, and I've set out there, just to remind the court very briefly, where adjournment was sought by counsel, then instructed, the adjournment was refused, and the case proceeded. But that judge did uh, make adverse findings against the appellant, but he accepted certain aspects uh, uh, as well. Now, this judge uh, in 2020 uh, was saying it is consistent with what we know about Sri Lanka. Uh, and that's, uh, I respectfully say, very difficult if trying to look at the case uh, holistically, which she was required to do. Well, and she, knew, she knew that. See paragraph 20 of her determination. Paragraph 20, my lady. I must undertake a holistic assessment of yes. all of the evidence before me as it stands at the date of the hearing. Yeah, the, the, the problem with those standard paragraphs, if I take you to paragraph 11, please, page 41, I must consider the best interests of the appellant's minor children as a primary fact. But there aren't any. And I, I, I haven't raised it before because it would be on its own not, 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 not a good point, but... Yes, she has set out the template, but she's wrong at paragraph 11. Has she actually applied what she should? And, and, and that, that, that's, that's the difficulty. And indeed, if, if I take you, if I take the court, please, to 23, uh, paragraph 23, <coughs> I should say there's a subheading of the appeal hearing. Says that paragraph 22, I heard evidence from the appellant um, background to where the, the family still live. And then at 23, I asked the appellant why I had no evidence from his brother or his son. The appellant told me that he didn't see it was important. I didn't find this to be a credible answer, given that he confirmed that his son has claimed protection on a similar basis to him, uh, namely ethnicity linked to LTTE. Um, there's a slight um, variation of that that she's recorded there. I think she, she says later the judge in her judge in her decision 
um, the appellant said he didn't think it was relevant, or whether he said it wasn't relevant or it wasn't important. But my submission is this, that she wasn't making her findings until paragraph 35 on page 48, because she's given a subheading of findings of fact and conclusion. And she says, having considered all the evidence, and I find the following. Um, so what was she doing at paragraph 23 by immediately making an adverse finding? Has she really considered the case holistically? Uh, and th th this is why, for the court's benefit, I've taken those ten items. I think I got to nine, but the tenth one is the prescribed organization, so it's an easy one. Um, and then applying those, here is uh, an appellant with the ethnicity, with all of uh, the factors that I refer to, including TGTE, including prescribed organization, wholly different from, which is wholly different from GJ in 2013. May I take you to GA very, very briefly. It's a very, very long uh, decision. Uh, and I'll take you to, I think... Um, you, you say wholly different from GJ. What KK was? No, uh, uh, the facts of this appellant with yeah. those two factors were very wholly, wholly different because he has his link to TGTE and TGTE is proscribed. And the further sub-point was uh, GJ, the country guide in 2013, did not consider HJ Iran or the principles which arose. And they should have, I respectfully say, with respect to them, because the case, uh, the Supreme Court's decision had been uh, handed down. Not necessarily. It depends what, the, what issues the, it was set up to decide. No problem in tribunals deciding HJ Iran cases after GJ, and presumably they did for many years. But, um, anyway, it was well, decided in KK to, to give guidance on that as well. That's fine. But th that's all what, that really doesn't, <coughs> that really doesn't arise, does it? Well, I, I respect to say it, it, it does, because it, the Supreme Court authority says this is the way to consider an asylum claim. No, an it, asylum claim. it says this is the way to consider an asylum claim where the fact relied on is that when I go back to the country of return, I will wish to uh, manifest my sexuality or, in the case of RT Zimbabwe, um, uh, maintain my political views when asked. M M but M Lord, that's fine. Um, my Lord, rephrasing that, it's might you be perceived as somebody who's come from the hotspot of London, where is, it, where is this diaspora? And the government of Sri Lanka takes the view that it does, that it wants to stamp out in a yeah. violent way the uh, separatist movement and to make sure it, it doesn't, as it were, get off the ground. The, the important reason why GJ needed to consider it, I respectfully say, is because there's a duty on both sides to bring to the court's attention when considering refugee convention grounds uh, what further aspects and consideration there ought to be. So if, if the, the point here was what might happen to GJ on his return to Sri Lanka? Yes. Well, it he, is for him to say, surely, um, if it is his case, that uh, irrespective of what may happen to me at the airport and all these questions that are kind of considered by GJ, I might sail through there, not be of any interest to the Sri Lankan government on account of my sure plus activities, but I can tell you now that I, when I get there, I'm going to put a banner up in the town square saying um, uh, we want a separate Tamil state. If that was his case, yes. he's got to advance that. I, I, I would respectfully agree with that, but he didn't... Uh, GJ would not need to have gone so far because GJ would merely have to say I've come from this hotspot and, and, and such like and if they ask me what have you been doing in London and uh, what's your view about separatist uh, move, a separatist movement I would have to give the truth well, and that's, that's, that I respectfully say was 
very, very important on JGI. Surprisingly, it wasn't considered. It may be the reason it wasn't considered, as happens with country guides in the case, is that they consider over a long period of time because it's listed for two days, they run out of time because it's, it's much more complicated than everybody thought, and it takes several months to resolve this. And they stuck to the original parameters of what they were going to consider. Well, this doesn't get to they're speculating about. Yeah. Well, well in, in any event, uh, 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 th that's my submission in relation to it, but it has been dealt with since. Um, and I say the relevance is that because it, GJ was not considered, this court can, and indeed I respectfully say should, look at the way in which the, the case through the lens of HJ Iran. Yeah, I, there's no difficulty about that. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, well, Assuming the point was taken. And yes. Evidence for it. Evidence yes. for it. Well, and, and, and so, so taking you to um, uh, G. J. In, in the well, there's a very helpful index at the beginning of the decision, which tells us what the particular issues were that yes. were being considered by the other tribunal. Yes, so they, they, one sees that at the foot of page five of the yes. decision. Yes, the, the, these judicial head notes are excellent. Uh, I'm very grateful for that. May I just skip, skim through to paragraph 30 just for a, a, a moment, which it, it just reminded me when I was making my submission earlier about uh, the duty in refugee convention case on, as it were, both sides. Slightly different point, but about disclosure. Well, hang on. Look. So, I mean, you, I don't want you to stop you making any point, but we seem to be getting a scattergun of points. We haven't got a disclosure issue in this case, or at least if we have, I haven't seen any sign of it in the Stellar argument or the, or the um, uh, grounds. And I think we want to focus on the points that are before the court and which we have to decide. I, I'm very good. I, I just wanted to, I, I just happened to, uh, uh, as it were, turn that uh, page up to, to really just stress the importance of, uh, of both sides when, when it comes to these sorts of cases to ensure that the right decision uh, is made. But I was going to take you, the court to pages 67 and 68 uh, in case the judicial head note wasn't complete which has the country guidance, and then to... Uh, to take back, where are, you, where, are you, where are you taking this to? Page 67? Page 67 of uh, GJ, please. Yes. And, what? and that's the country guidance. Paragraph 356 is where it starts, and I'm going to take you... Well, hang on. To the bottom I, of that. Okay, but uh, that is actually identical to the head notes, isn't it? I mean, that's the way they do it. I don't mind where, where we look at it, but the idea that, that, that the head note might not be complete and we get it from paragraph 356 isn't, isn't right. They're, they're in the same, they're identical. I'm, I'm grateful. Well, I, it's, okay, it's, what, what's the, what, what's so the particular three, bit five, you wanted to show us? 356, uh, subparagraph 7, subparagraph A. Th this was what the upper tribunal said was to be the um, test. Individuals who are or who are perceived to be a threat to the integrity of Sri Lanka as a single state because they are or are perceived to have a sufficient role in relation to post-conflict Tamil separatism within the diaspora and or a renewal of hostilities uh, within uh, Sri Lanka. And then at eight, um, last three lines or so, in post-conflict Sri Lanka, an individual's past history were relevant only to the extent that it's perceived by the Sri Lankan authorities as indicating a present risk to the unitary Sri Lankan state of the Sri Lankan uh, government. Uh, and then nine, last two lines or so, and this was uh, in relation to airport and watch, that would be a question of fact in each case, dependent on any uh, diaspora activities carried out by such an individual bring that together and this uh, survived the, the KK is to the same effect is simply that KK gave more guidance on what was meant by the phrase significant role is that correct yes my love. yes e e exactly I'm very grateful exactly so so uh, I said even though it's very long I'm not going to uh, decision I'm not going to refer at length to that and then to continue th this submission may I take you to K 
KK at the upper tribunal with the, as it were, health warning that it wasn't applicable as of December 2020. And that's um, tab 18. Again, because of the, the, the length of the decision, it's probably easy if I just go through uh, the four or five different uh, entries that I'm going to take you to, but just uh, go through it in terms of page numbers or paragraph numbers. First of all, uh, to page 74, uh, please, which is paragraph 307, 307. Sorry, we're across... Uh, Page seventy-four. Right, we haven't. We haven't. Um, well, paragraph three hundred seven, my lord. If it's not numbered. Okay, I'll have, I had to bring my computer. I have it on my computer because I didn't. Three hundred seven of the upper tribunal decision. In KK, yes, please, my lord. Yeah. Yeah. You haven't got this. No, I haven't got it. My lady hasn't got this. Um, tab eighteen. Uh, the tab eighteen is merely a head note. A head note. Ah, yes. So this was this was the uh, authority. I think the email said, "Don't bring copies." So yes, no, that, was, that was my fault. I did say that. Um, so I didn't. I, was, I thought printing out a thousand pages over yes. time might be easy. I think that was our and I, 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 I knew that I could access it through my computer, but I am afraid I didn't advise my lady to bring hers. But I think if you read out the passage, yes, uh, we can have and access. This is about Mr. Yokelingham. Exactly. So I, I, it was just really in, in, in reference. Uh, he, he gave evidence, and this is where they said he gave candid evidence of uh, fact in relation. And I think it's cross referred to, just for your notes, 136. Yes, 136, where his full name is provided, Mr. Sokolingham, Yogalingham. But I mean, to what submission does this, does this go? Well, well I, I, as I was saying, uh, to, to, to ease rather than taking back and forth lots of pages. Uh, I'll go through this uh, and then uh, I'll bring all of this together in just a moment. But I just want to make good the submission I made earlier, which is that Mr. Yogalingam did give evidence to the uh, upper tribunal in KK. Uh, the view uh, of the tribunal was that he was uh, a reliable witness. Uh, and that was the letter, uh, he, that was the author, he was the author rather, of the letter uh, in this case as well. Well, he's the claimed author of the letter because he didn't give evidence and um, the letter was produced at the last minute so there's no opportunity to verify its content. My lady, there was no application by the Secretary of State to seek verification and they really do. If the Secretary of State, properly represented on that occasion, wanted that opportunity, they would have asked and they didn't. Um, so... Uh, it, it, the, the, those are my submissions with respect to yes. the... Yes. Uh, where, where, where that you're saying you ain't taking that in passing. What's the actual part you want to take us to? So then if I uh, take you please uh, to paragraph 378. Again, uh, this deals with TGT being a remaining a prescribed organisation. Well, I, I think there's a dispute about that. Yes, exactly. Um, 404 uh, the party's agreed position was that there's no evidence to indicate that the level of infiltration surveillance and monitoring has ceased what happened was that the well, the tribe was referring to GJ to say this is the level of yeah, I think I put all this to you Mr um, basically KK says the position is still as it was in GJ um, so I'm, I'm not trying to give you a hard time. I just, I just, I'm not quite clear why you're taking us to KK. I'm, if it's just to say nothing has changed, I don't think that's uh, in, 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 in issue. But if there's some more particular point, please let us know. Yes, what it, is. It, it, it was. It's to make good what I was saying earlier. That when I said earlier, Mr. Yogalingam, is this person, I respectfully say, of some repute. You've said that point already, yeah. Uh, and then similarly, 
the evidence in respect of prescribed, where do I get it from? It's there. Yes. And then well, it's if protected I take... in the decision letter. Yes. Yes, it is. Uh, but there's no point taking us to authorities. It just confuses us. Um, uh, except to establish some proposition which is important to your submission. Then, of course, you must do it. Yes. But I just want to know what, why we're being taken to KKA. If it's just a series yes. of footnotes like this, I don't think it's necessary. Yes, because the judge didn't evaluate uh, what prescribed would mean to this appellant. He's, he's involved with whether it's I think the word is low-level helper helping in the community in twenty in the twenty seventeen letter or more in twenty twenty. Um, if that's his level of involvement, even of that low level, uh, it shows uh, that he could be a person of interest. And what I'm coming on to is, would he be a person of interest if? stopped and asked questions either at the airport or later when visited in his uh, hometown or village. And again, I won't, I won't take the court to the mechanics of what happens when they go through the airport or what happens when they have to get ID documents and such like. But if I may um, take you to page 414 which is the Tra uh, paragraph, lengthy paragraph dealing with. Four one four. Sorry, of what? Of uh, KK. I've only got it on the screen. So what paragraph? Four one four. I thought you said page four one four. My apologies. Four, right. Okay. Yeah. Quite a long paragraph with ten sub paragraphs. Uh, and again, without uh, I'm conscious that not everybody has this uh, in front of them. Um, Roman one is whether the individual is associated in any way with a particular diaspora organisation. Two, whether they've attended meetings. Or like. um, and so he, he does. He, the appellant does come in that category. Is connected to a prescribed organisation. He has attended these meetings. Uh, and arguably comes in other uh, sub-paragraphs as well. But, but it's accepted that KK is a decision that was made after the decision of the FCC in this case. So what point are you seeking to derive from KK? You can't rely on KK and say the FCC erred because it didn't take KK into account. It couldn't do. It's not a soothsayer. Well, well, lady, I accept that. that, that that's why... Uh, I use the rather so casual phrase, it's a health... Sorry, I'm just not understanding yes. what submission you're making. It was wrong KK. for... Sorry for interrupting, my apologies. No, no, go on. It, wrong for Judge Ford to say, GJ and that's it. She had to go further and to look at the prescribed organisation link. And she didn't. Well, was anything made of it at the FTT? I mean, there, was yeah, no well, dispute, there was no dispute about it. It was accepted in the decision letter. And the judge should have then gone on to say, because of this link, this appeal has to be allowed. <laughs> Even what? KK had been law, that wouldn't have been that wouldn't have been the case, would it? KK doesn't say if you are a member of a prescribed organisation. End of story. The also awesome mission is the appeal should have succeeded because he had an association with a prescribed organisation. Is that the submission? Along with all of the other findings uh, which uh, have been made, and that I've and the accepted facts which I've set out in that list of ten, that is uh, a decision which was uh, very much uh, open to the judge. If the, this court decides, well, well it's actually, a question of whether more... the decision was open to the judge. It's a question of whether it's the only decision she could have reached. Is that your submission? What I've said in my skeleton argument, I hope it was a fair submission, that if uh, further evidence is required or further analysis is required, then the correct approach for this court would be to remit the case to the upper tribunal for the decision to be made in respect of it. Um, 
but they, it shows a material error of law if this very significant, important change from GJ has not been properly analysed by Judge Ford. If one looks at KK and goes to paragraph 470, 475, they talk about what are the relevant factors to consider, which is, do they have a significant role as properly understood, and what did they do? Um, uh, and there's nothing there that, that um, the first tier tribunal judge doesn't appear to have done. She appears to have assessed what was his role at, at the particular time. Well, 477, staying on that page, yeah. uh, my lord, the first relevant factor is the nature underlined by the tribunal of any particular organisation on behalf of which an individual has been active. So, so, so that, 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 that's my submission, that GJ didn't have a prescribed organisation. What should this judge have done? And this is where I say the mental, mental gymnastics come about, and I appreciate KK didn't apply to Judge Ford. But my submission is she should have looked at this huge change, this link by this appellant to well, the, the, the second organization. factor there is um, what's he actually done. Um, and in the middle of paragraph 46, um, the judge finds if Helen is not a person of any influence in the TGT, she doesn't say it's a prescribed organization, but she knows that because she well, said so earlier. But he doesn't, need to, uh, he doesn't need to be high level. No, or, or he, he still needs to have a significant role um, under the country guidance, but of course you're looking at a holistic view. Paragraph 482, look at, see exactly what they've done. And the, the, the tribunal in KK keeps on saying uh, uh, that it's a cumulative, I'm just repeating what my Lord said, it's a cumulative assessment to which, in which these uh, may be relevant considerations will be relevant considerations, but their weight will depend on the circumstances. But 476, what follows on exhaustive list, examples of elements which will inform a cumulative assessment predicated in all cases on careful fact-finding. Yes. 478, that an organisation has been proscribed under the regulations will be relatively significant terms of the level of adverse interest reasonably likely to be attributed to an individual associated with it, although it's not determinative of risk. Yes. So well, that's proscription by under the UN regulations. I think the pres pr pr proscription which is referred to in the decision letter is proscription by the yes, Sri Lankan government. I think they did, they, they used that regulation. Uh, I think it was explained. Yes, they, they, yes. they, they did yes. and then they delisted five organisations and there was some dispute about what was the effect of that delisting. Well, Lord, well, Lord. Uh, but, but, but Lord, staying with 476 then, uh, and you'll have guessed my, my <coughs> submission on this, uh, the cumulative assess assessment predicated in all cases on careful fact-finding. And I took the court to paragraph 48, where the judge says, you've got a consistent account with the background evidence, but I dismiss it. Um, and uh, the paragraphs which I took you to, which I took the court to earlier, related, referring to paragraph 23, where an immediate decision is made about credibility, not later under holistic references. No, it's not to an children. immediate decision about credibility as a whole. It's about it's a, it's a decision about whether his explanation for not calling relevant witnesses was credible or not. It's a different point. Yes, uh, and. But, but it might be true, and it needs to be considered holistically. That, that's, that's the trouble. But my lady, right at the start, the judge said, I don't believe you on this important point. When you say right at the start, what do you mean? At paragraph 23. Oh, I see, you're right at the start of the decision. You mean not yes. at the start of the hearing, right? But it's a yes. completely discreet issue. You could, you could find it incredible that he didn't call to potentially relevant evidence, uh, to potentially relevant witnesses, Without, without making any finding about credibility of the account as a whole, because you haven't considered it yet. 
And, but she and she should have done that if she 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 should have. Well, so she said, should have moved paragraph twenty three to the end and said, "Oh, and by the way, I find his explanation for not calling these witnesses incredible." M my lady. So, so she, the will judge complaint that paragraph twenty three is in the wrong bit of the decision. Well, it, it brings to mind how one should put decisions together or play a piece of music or such like. It's very important what order it goes in. And if if the judges said, and uh, the upper tribunal judges said, well, this judge looked at things holistically, and actually she didn't, because at the start she said, I don't believe you. That's not holistic. But she wasn't saying, I don't believe a word you're telling me. She's saying, I don't believe what you're telling me about why you didn't call these two witnesses. Yes, and why not then take into account everything else that the witnesses said? Well, about in all order these other to evaluate whether or not the explanation for not calling the witnesses is credible. For example, the, the witness said, uh, the appellant said, sorry, uh, I have these medical ailments, I have problems with my eyesight and such like. And the judge said, well, you haven't produced a proper report, I've got some references to medication and such like. Might that have made a difference in the holistic assessment? I'll, ju I'll just pause there for, for a moment. Way away, yeah. way away from anything that's in the grounds of appeal or anything that's in the Sturton argument. Well, I, it, it you, just you, we can't sorry. do appeals in this way in the Sturton Fund, uh, Mr. Mahmood. Thank you. I, I'm very grateful. <coughs> I, I, I'm just going to fi finish this. A, a thought came to mind, which was, again, in relation to, to ground one, which I think is very succinctly put in terms of this holistic assessment of a refugee convention claim. Can, can I just... Uh, take a moment just, just to turn that up and I promise I'll be brief in respect of that and I think this will probably deal quite um, swiftly with the point which I'm trying to make about um, this holistic assessment and uh, how it is is considered just to find that because I've very familiar with this, uh, tab 5, Karakaran, in the Court of Appeal. And if I may, the Lord Justice Sedley's judgment. starts, the Australian Federal Court put the issues well. Rajalingam, the, uh, I'm confused. Which, which you were, you were about to say that about? <coughs> Sorry, perhaps it's easier if I don't find it in your yes, sir. Yes. Which, which paragraph in the search argument? Uh, Twelve, please. So, so uh, at, at the bottom of my paragraph 12, yep. such decision makers on classic principle of public law require that every, 
everything, every material, everything material into account, my apologies, the source of information will frequently go well beyond the testimony of the applicant and include in country reports, expert testimony, and sometimes specialist knowledge of their own, which must of course be disclosed. No probabilistic cut off operates here. Everything capable of handling the bearing has to be given the way, great or little, due to it. What the decision makers ultimately make of the material is a matter for their own consci uh, conscientious judgment, so long as the procedure by which they approach and entertain is lawful and fair, provided their decision logically addresses the convention issues. Finally, importantly, convention issues from first to last are evaluative, uh, not factual. And then over the page, um, again, my uh, uh, underlining. Um, the issues for a decision maker under the convention, paraphrasing, are questions not of hard fact, but of evaluation. Does the applicant have a well-founded fear of persecution for convention reasons? Why is he here, etc., 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 is set out. I'm paraphrasing this. Um, and then about six lines from the bottom uh, of that paragraph 15, what matters throughout is that the applicant's autobiographical account is only part of the picture. People have not yet suffered actual persecution. One thinks of many Jews who fled Nazi Germany just in time. And have a very well-founded fear of persecution, should they remain. People who have suffered appalling persecution may, for one reason or another, not come within the protection of the Convention. And then, finally, uh, next paragraph, four lines, fourth line, the paragraph in the middle which begins, it is true that in general legal process partitions, its material so, uh, so as to segregate past events and apply the civil standard of proof to them, so that liability for negligence will depend on a probabilistic conclusion as to what happened. Uh, but this is by no means a whole process of uh, uh, reasoning. So just, just pausing there, I, I respectfully say, although a listic and such like is more common parlance now in different divisions of uh, 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 the High Court, everything is taken into account. Take it, re uh, read the background material, consider everything, then come to your conclusions. So remaining with KK, does the court really have, in an asylum case, uh, what is mandated in respect of the careful decision making which was required, and I, I respectfully say, no, um, it very clearly uh, was not uh, in, in this uh, in this case in this instance. Yes. Now, what else have you? Staying with uh, KK, which of course I know that my lord, the vice president, uh, considered as a permission to appeal uh, along with uh, Lady Justice uh, uh, Andrews. That decision, uh, has, there's permission to cite that, uh, uh, even though it was a permission decision, and that is uh, hopefully within the bundle of authority. It is, is, yes. Good. What, what passage do you want to take us to? Or if, even if I, before you do that, what proposition yes, do you hope to get out of it? Uh, precisely, so I was going to uh, say, here is the overview, uh, and indeed in terms of the uh, uh, proposition. Um, so, so firstly, insofar as whether there'd be uh, an inclination by the Government of Sri Lanka to inquire into uh, a person's good or bad faith in terms of their uh, surplus activities or their time in a hotspot. And my respectful submission is it's very clear that there will be no such inclination by the Government of Sri Lanka to inquire into. An individual. What the what we said in KK, and it was not strictly speaking us <laughs> saying it, it was us saying that the upper tribunal was entitled to say it. 
uh, was that if you reached a the correct threshold of significant activity or the necessary threshold of significant activity for GOSL to regard you as a risk, GOSL were not likely to say, ah, yes, it looks as though they're doing all these very significant things, but maybe they don't mean it. But the premise of the whole reasoning of the upper tribunal, which we endorsed, was that a significant threshold had been reached. That doesn't have any relevance to the present case, because the finding in the present case was that a significant threshold hadn't been reached. I expressed that not quite accurately. That the threshold of finding that the appellant played a significant role in separatist activities had not been reached. Isn't it? So I don't think that that proposition, which you correctly summarise, as far as it goes, really has any relevance to the problem that you're facing in this case. My, my, my Lord, if the, the, the point, taking that a little bit further, is this, this first-year tribunal judge was looking for committed activism. She said you're, you're not genuinely Well, no, she committed. wasn't. We've been over this. She was looking at whether there was a significant role. It's true she, in that context, she mentioned genuine commitment. But she did not treat that as the touchstone. We've looked at all this already in your submissions when we looked at paragraph 46. Uh, it was 47, I do not accept that this appellant is genuine. Yes, well, but 46 is more important from your point of view because she says it's in 46 as well. Well, 46 is the one that creates the problem for you, not 47. If, if, if I take the court to, I think it's about nine, nine or ten lines down, a, paragraph, a sentence which begins, I find that given the timing and level of his involvement, the court has that, I'll continue reading. I find that given that, this paragraph 46, page 49, I find that given the timing and the level of his involvement with the TGTE, his activities for the group are entirely self-serving and not motivated, not motivated by any genuine commitment to the cause of an independent Tamil state. That's true. She does say that. Yes. Before that, she says, I'm not satisfied that those activities will be known to the Sri Lankan authorities or will be of any interest to them. It's all in the same paragraph where she's made the wrong, there's an error of law. She, she has taken into account when assessing the overall uh, plausibility or credibility of this witness with an error of law. And that, What's that's the error of law? The, the, the error of law is she has looked for genuine commitment. But I put you earlier, and I didn't understand you to disagree, but the genuine commitment may be relevant to the question of whether you are when you reach what I've been calling the threshold, that is to say whether you have played a significant role in separatist activity, and whether you will be perceived as having done that. Yes, it, it, there's actually three points there, my, my Lord. It's the perception, what did you do, and was it significant? So the first, the first problem is the perception. And I respectfully say, being linked to a prescribed organisation Coming from a hotspot, any perception, any reason we could consider perception is you are uh, a separatist. Next is, well, how high level do they have to be? <coughs> That's not so straightforward a, 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 a question and answer, I accept. But there's that list of 10 items which apply to this appellant. Um, but I respectfully submit the, the KK does not say the appellant needs to be high 
profile, it's how effective they are in what they do. And I think there were some examples given. Uh, there might be somebody who is low level but actually is pretty effective because they raise small amounts of money from each individual person but there's lots of them and that money is then used as far as the government of Sri Lanka sees it as uh, but, you, but you can't rely on the analysis in KK to establish an error of either the FCT in this case because of the dates I accept that yes I, ac I accept that well, so why, but, are you, why are you referring us to KK in this context well it, it, in, I refer to it in this context because it makes good what has been said in our grounds of appeal, which is that the judge has materially heard to say there needs to be this genuine political motivation. There does not. And again, I, as I respectfully said earlier, there is this mental gymnastics because you have a country guidance case saying, saying what it does, but it does not disentitle an appellant to say this is what the Supreme Court said. This is Supreme Court authority. It needs to be followed. This is the way Karen Karan makes clear that the judge, the first year tribunal judge, should have been looking at uh, the case, uh, assessing everything. And if she's made that material error, which I respectfully say it is, in the context of a refugee convention claim, uh, puts the it puts the appellant in a very precarious position where there is an identified error in the way in which the judge is considered. E even if one puts to one side paragraph 47, it's all past the same paragraph 46. These are my views. You're not genuinely pleased. Uh, well, we have your point on that. Yes. Um, I noticed the time. If you told us at 12, you only expect it to be another half an hour. Apologies. Sorry. How much longer do you expect to be? May I just take stock, and I'll check with my instructions, probably a quarter of an hour, my lord. Okay, well, there does have to be some discipline about this. Yes. We, we, we need to know. I, I have the impression that, quite apart from some points which are not in the Sterlison argument, or the grounds, um, we have covered most of the matters that are in the Sterlison argument, or the grounds. <coughs> the only ones I'm aware of that haven't been covered are ground three, which I think is largely parasitical on the other grounds, yes. and a particular point about his passport having expired. Um, uh, uh, I'm not aware of anything else that I feel you have, I'm still waiting to hear what you have to say about it, but I think you, if you're going to address this after lunch on anything other than those two points, we need to know precisely what it is and why you say you haven't covered it already. Okay, well, we'll sit again at, at, uh, 